Hi, welcome back. In this video, we're going to be talking about chapter four of A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. Uh, and as always, we're going to open up with a passage. You're so flexible, fluid. You don't even know how many of you there are or where you are. You just go with the flow. I figured you'd be all numbers and logic, structured, strict, you know? Moscap looked amused. What a curious notion. Is it? Like you said, you're a machine. And? And machines only work because of numbers and logic. Mm, that's how we perceive, not how we function. Moscap touched their metal torso, smiling with pride. I'm made of metal and numbers. You are made of water and genes. But we are each something more than that. In chapter 4 of A Psalm for the Wild Built, Dex and Moscap begin on their journey together. Most of the chapter is a conversation between the two as they get to know each other. Specifically, the chapter focuses on being... Well, Dex assumed that robots would be very logical in nature. Uh, they're surprised to find that Moscap is very fluid. Moscap argues against this assumption, claiming that many living things might be more similar to what humans would perceive as logical. For example, ants follow a very logical, structured pattern. Moscap uses the painting on the wagon as an analogy. While one can describe the painting as a combination of paints and wood, humans are more likely to perceive it as a picture or as what it represents. In the same way, it would be inaccurate to assume that a robot perceives itself or a human uh, should perceive itself as numbers and zeros rather than perceiving itself as a conscious being. Additionally, Moscap argues that the same goes for humans. The baser functioning is still present, but there are complexities on top of this logical thinking. Um, so this whole book, it really does dive into kind of very much an ecological kind of view of not only... Uh, how humans perceive the world, but also how they uh, perceive themselves as separate from that world. And we're going to get more into that in the chapter. Um, but this kind of discussion about kind of the assumptions that humans are making is really going to be present as we go forward in this book. Um, in this chapter, we learn a lot more about robot society as well. One thing that's abundantly clear is that robots function like a society of scientists with no need for shelter or food or water, and a seemingly extended lifespan. We'll get more into that in following chapters. The robots wander around while observing and learning about the natural world. Various robots specialize in different things, but Moscap is more of a generalist. Their society is rather anarchic in that they form together for small temporary journeys, but they have no structure or dictates or clans that need to be followed. They're not building any grand thing. They're not necessarily creating works of art that we know of. Um, instead, they're just observing and enjoying their observations. So one of the big questions of this story at this point is why is robot society effectively a society of scientists and observers? What do you think the novel is implying about what life would be like without worrying about food, shelter, poverty, and disease? As always, cite the text and any other sources to support your answer. With that said, uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you in chapter five.